I'd ask you please to take your Bible and turn with me to the 34th Psalm tonight, to begin with anyway, Psalm 34. <clears throat> While you're turning to the 34th Psalm, I just want to remind us that we're all a mess. The human condition, you're human. The human condition, it's bad news. And it all goes all the way back to that beautiful garden paradise. The Bible calls it the Garden of Eden. And that was where everything fell apart because of the choice of that human pair, Adam and Eve, sin entered into the human race. It's called the fall. They call it the fall in the Garden of Eden. Not the season, but the sin. And as a result of the fall of mankind, the human condition is one of ups and downs. And by the way, I think you've discovered that that's even true after you're saved. I want to submit to you that the human condition that we are all suffering in is a God-given situation. By that, I don't mean that we blame God for the fall of human beings. But I mean that all of the conditions and all of the situations that you and I, in our human condition, encounter actually fall into part of God's plan for you. You've been having some rough days lately? <laughs> Listen to me. This is truth. This is biblical truth. Nothing absolutely nothing that is permitted to enter into your experience doesn't have God in it. There is no second cause. By that I mean this. Either directly or indirectly, God is involved in all of our condition and all of our circumstances and all our situations, and ultimately, he has a good purpose in everything, or he would never allow that to touch our lives. Listen to this poem. I read it recently, and I can't get away from this poem. In the center of the circle of the will of God I stand, as I launch from sheltering harbor to obey all his commands. What though waves overwhelm my vessel and grim fears my faith assail, still I'll stay upon his promise, for that cannot, will not fail. Listen closely. In the center of the circle of the will of God I stand, where the warfare wages fiercest, tis the place he has planned. Though dread foes may storm my castle, and the battle seem but lost, I will claim in him the victory and hold on whatever the cost. In the center of the circle of the will of God I stand. Listen to this phrase. In the center of the circle of the will of God I stand, there can be no second causes. All must come from his dear hand. When dark clouds obscure my vision, and the way I cannot see, I will trust him in the darkness, for I know he pilots me. There's other verses to that poem, but you get the point. <laughs> the point is that your situation is God-given. Whether directly or indirectly, your situation, whatever it entails, is God-given. So it's a God-given situation that we're in, in our human condition, but it also has with it a God-given solution. 
All God-given situations have a God-given solution. I love the book of the Psalms, and I know many of you do too. And when I study the book of the Psalms, and if you study Psalms long enough, you know what you're going to find? You're going to find that there is a psalm for every human emotion and every human situation. You'll find that in the book of the Psalms. Times of difficulty, moments of joy, tragic times, moments of praise. It's exciting to actually take the Psalms. There's 176 of them, by the way, that make up the book the longest book in the Bible. There's 176 Psalms. It's exciting to take the book of the Psalms and to pick one and then try to guess what in the writer's life provoked him to write that Psalm. You first read the Psalm carefully to see what it says and then try to read the Psalm again and read between the lines, if you can, to relate that psalm to different aspects of your life. You'd ask yourself the question, what human condition would cause a person to write a psalm like this? What was he going through? What was he up against? What was he facing? Unique to... The Psalms is that it is uh, an exposition of life experience. That's why it's so helpful. That's why it's like a, a spiritual medicine to go to the book of the Psalms. You know, when you get a headache, uh, perhaps you go to your, your medicine cabinet and you grab some Tylenol or Excedrin, whatever you take. When you have spiritual need in your life, you can go to the spiritual medicine cabinet of the Psalms and you can find there what you need at that moment, what the human condition is and match it with the Psalm. In fact, the Psalms really are a spiritual diary of these people's lives. Have you ever read someone else's diary? Shame on you. You're not supposed to do that. I remember my sisters had diaries and they locked them. They had a little lock and a key, you know, and I wasn't supposed to get anywhere near that diary unless I snuck and I knew where the key was. Well, you know what? Psalms is a spiritual diary, but it's not a secret. You can, you can read what is going on in these people's lives because they've recorded their spiritual diary so that you can be helped by it. In fact, the more time that you spend with the psalmist, the more helpful the psalms will become because you'll be able to, to learn to match your feeling and your situation with the corresponding psalm and then use it to create hope and bring peace just like it did in his life. And, uh, and it will move you to worship and praise him and thank God as a result. So, yeah. The human condition is a big mess, but our situations are God-given, and there are God-given solutions. We're turning here to Psalm 34 in a moment. I'll look at a couple of verses there with you, but I wanted to say this as well. Not only do we have God-given situations and a God-given solution, but we have God-given emotions. It's not wrong to have emotions. We're created by God for himself, and we're created as his imagers. And God has equipped us with a free will. And God has made us in his image, and so we have a self-awareness. We mirror our experience within our soul. We have a soul life. And in that soul life, various emotions are expressed and impact our whole personality. And so it uh, these emotions also 
affect and cause different physiological effects as well. For example, an increasing heart rate or an adrenaline rush or, or sweaty palms. And one of the, the most familiar and frequent emotions that you and I will have all of our lives from childhood till death is the emotion of fear. Psalm 34 speaks to that. And so having turned there, let me turn your attention to verse 4. The psalmist says, I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Go down to verse 6. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. Name some fears. What are some fears that are common to you or to humans, to all of us? What are some fears that we might have? Safety. Fears of uh, safety. What else? Fears of loss. Fears of change. Fears of uncertainty. I mean, the list goes on. In fact, I want you to note in verse 6, the word troubles there really connects with the word fear because the word troubles is the word that means dread. It means terror. It's an, it's an intense kind of fear. It's the kind of pressure that takes your breath away. Have you ever hit something or, or been hit by something or someone that knocks the wind out of you? That's what the word troubles means. It's having the wind knocked out of you. That's what fear does to you. That's what do you do with fears? Well, let's look again of what he says there in the fourth verse. What did he do? I sought the Lord. He heard me. He delivered me out of all of my fears. The answer to fears, whatever the fear might be, is to seek the Lord. To seek the Lord. Listen to me. This is very important. To seek the Lord, not to have him get rid of your fears. The psalmist says, I was fearful. I had intense trouble, dread, terror. But I found that God can break the strangle grip of fear in my life. So I, I turned to God, and when I turned to God, he enabled me to embrace my fear. Did you note verse 4? Look at it closely. Because it doesn't say that God delivers us from fear, but it says that God delivers us in our fear. God doesn't deliver us from fear because it is through our fear that we recognize, you know what? I can't go on. I can't live without God. He doesn't uh, deliver us from fear, but he delivers us in our fear. Because our fear, God uses that to drive us to himself. And then he delivers you in that way, and he causes you to give thanks for your fear, because through your fear you found him. And he's greater than your fear. But I want you to turn from Psalm 34 over to Psalm 91. In Psalm 91, this is a particular kind of fear that is different from normal fear. He says in... <clears throat> In verses uh, 11 and 12, 
He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in thy in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in thy hands, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. A long time ago, when I was a very young pastor, one night, about one o'clock in the morning, we had a landline then. I don't even have a landline anymore. The phone rang at one o'clock in the morning. And it woke me up out of a sound sleep. My wife didn't wake up, but I got up. I answered the phone. And when I got on the phone, there was several teenagers, young people, and they were just full of fear because they were having some type of an experience in one of their homes where there is demonic activity going on. They were seeing supernatural things happening at that moment and they were scared out of their wits and i remember i was on that phone with them for an hour and throughout that conversation look i was a young pastor i didn't know everything that i know now about the devil and how to deal with fear i knew a little i knew enough i guess and i helped them as best as i could and uh then they said, we want to come over to your house and, you know, we, we, we want to talk with you further. I said, well, you know, it's almost two o'clock in the morning. Uh, can we do it, you know, the first thing tomorrow morning? And uh, yeah, sure. And then uh, I said, well, let me, uh, you know, let me tell you where I live. They said, oh, we already know where you live. And I said, okay, okay, no problem. I set up a time. We'll meet in the morning. <clears throat> Two o'clock. Phone conversation's over. I go back to bed. My wife's sound asleep. And I'm laying there. And I'm telling you, I never experienced the kind of fear that I had that night after I went back to bed. I couldn't sleep. I never had such fear grip my heart as I did then. It was, it was demonic. It was something I, I can't even explain. I've, as I said, I've never experienced anything like it since. But I had all kinds of horrible things going, in, going on in my mind. It, it, it was demonic thoughts like they know where you live. They're, you can't go to sleep. If you go to sleep, they're going to come and break in your house and they're going to kill you and your family. They're going to uh, slaughter, you know, this the kind of horrible thoughts going through my mind. And so I woke up my wife and I said, I hate to do this to wake you up, but would you please pray for me? I'm having horrible thoughts. I can't sleep. I'm, I've never experienced fear like this. And so I don't know if she prayed or not, but I got up. And I went downstairs and I got my Bible and I didn't realize, I, I don't know how much I read and what I read, but I know when I got to Psalm 91, God gave me the answer to my fears. It was a tremendous experience, but I didn't know then what I know now. You know what I know now about Psalm 91? This is interesting. <laughs> God led me to this very psalm. And did you know that this psalm is about demonic activity? In fact, have you heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Well, the Dead Sea Scrolls, they uh, some of the teachings there teach that David wrote this psalm for people that were demon-possessed and that the, the rabbis in that uh, Second Temple period in that first uh, century and just before, considered Psalm 91 as an exorcist psalm, as a psalm to deliver people from demon possession. Isn't it interesting? I, I had no idea when God led me to that psalm when I was under demonic attack that night. And isn't it also interesting that the devil quoted Psalm 91 when he was tempting Jesus? This is a significant psalm when it comes to fears that are demonically inspired. 
And I don't know if you've experienced anything like that, but let me point a couple of things out to you. See verses five and six. He says, thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. I'm going to point out just several words uh, that uh, I'm not going to uh, give you the Hebrew word, but the word terror in verse 5, uh, the word pestilence in verse 6, the word destruction in verse 6, those three words in the Hebrew language were actually the names of Canaanite deities. We learn from the Apostle Paul that behind every idol is, the, is a demon. And so what he's saying here is that these rabbis considered this to be an exorcist psalm because it was dealing with demonic spirits, evil spirits. What may not be apparent at all regarding what the, the psalmist is saying to us in the English language is that he's dealing with demonic forces in the 91st Psalm. And it's necessary to realize that sometimes physical attacks could actually be spiritual attacks as well. These kinds, this kind of fear is not a natural fear. It's what I would call supernatural fear because it's severe, it's extreme, it's paralyzing. It, it's like you're frozen with fear. Have you ever had a dream and uh, in, in you're, you're in a life-threatening situation and, and maybe the guy has a, a gun in your dream point of your head and, and you can't even speak, let alone move? You're paralyzed, you're frozen with fear. Well, that's what he's talking about here, that kind of fear. It's a supernatural kind of fear. It's an implanted and it's fanned by demonic forces and it requires God's deliverance. Notice verse 9. Here's the conditions for deliverance. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague that, again, is a Canaanite deity, that word plague, come nigh thy dwelling. In other words, if you're trusting God, there's your personal responsibility, then God guarantees in verse 10 his divine care and his protection, and you can claim that promise. One thing that I didn't really know much about then when I had that experience that I know now is the truth of what we call the divine throne seat authority that we have in Christ. And I'm talking about the truth in Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 2 where it talks about Jesus because in his death and resurrection. He has totally defeated all the demonic powers. And as a result, he, in ascending to heaven, sits on the throne, and all these demonic powers are under his feet. And he says, and you are my body. And so because we're his body, we then have these demonic powers under our feet. His authority becomes the authority of his body, the church. And we are told in the next chapter, Ephesians chapter 2, that not only is Jesus seated on the right hand, but because we're his body, we're seated on the throne. We're on the throne with him. And so the authority of our throne seat in Christ gives us the authority and the power over all the demonic powers in the universe. And it's based upon who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. And as a result, knowing this truth and having this experience, every time fear 
from a demonic force has come to me. I know how to deal with it. And I have the victory. It's guaranteed. Because thou hast made the Lord my refuge, your habitation, no evil will befall thee. No plague, no demonic force will come nigh your dwelling. I don't fear the night. I don't fear the day. Notice he says here, verse 5, don't be afraid of the terror by night, demonic forces by night, nor the arrow that flieth by day, literally midday. It's a midday demon. It's actually what he's referring to there. I came across a wonderful story of a Chinese man that was an opium addict. He was a Confucian scholar, but he was also an opium addict. He stumbled into bed, overcome by his opium. The addiction had destroyed his once illustrious career as a Confucian scholar and a community leader. At 43, he was a helpless addict, but he accepted a position as a Chinese tutor for a foreign missionary. He resisted all their help, shunned their prayer meetings and their worship services. However, a Chinese Bible was placed in his room and that caught his attention. At first, he only had an academic interest. He wanted to read this Bible so that he could answer the questions of his students. But soon the story of Christ captured his imagination and spoke to the needs of his heart. And the more he read, the greater his sin and his helplessness seemed. And finally he believed on Christ. And then he saw a connection between his drug addiction and the work of the devil. And after years of addiction, this was the battle for his life. He cried out in pain, withdrawal. Devil? What can you do against me? My life is in the hand of God, and I am truly willing to break off opium and, and die, but I'm not willing to continue in sin and live. Through the trial of his withdrawal, he learned to pray and depend upon his newfound Savior. He joined the outgoing outreach uh, to opium addicts. A spirit of prayer and dependence on God permeated his work. Darkness comes in many forms. The unknown, drug addiction, demonic possession, discouragement, and doubt are but a few. God helps us to understand the resistance we face. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. What do we do when darkness descends? We put on the whole armor of God as we advance against the darkness, spearheading an attack on Satan's kingdom will not go unnoticed. And after describing the six aspects of God's armor in Ephesians 6, Paul links them to prayer in advance. What's the source of this boldness against darkness? The power of Christ. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Only in God's strength can we defeat darkness. Fear not. Go forward in the fog of this world. Walk in the dark with God. It's claiming him, his victory, his authority, his power in our lives as his people.